Um, so we're excited to have Debbie Bennett here today. She's with the Department of Public Health Sciences, which is part of the School of Medicine um, here at UC Davis. And she's going to be talking about indoor air um, issues. And I'll pass this to her. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's always a challenge. Okay, rally cry for <laughs> indoor air. <laughs> okay, so some of the pollutants that we're worried about in indoor air, some of the volatile organic compounds, and we'll touch mainly on benzene and formaldehyde and give some examples, and then particulate matter, and I know diesel particles because those ones are particularly toxic, and then we'll touch on ozone and some other semi-volatile organic compounds. So when people think about air pollution, they primarily think about outdoors, and the ambient concentration, but a portion of that is going to get into our indoor environment. Um, maybe not all of it, but a portion of it. And then within our indoor environment, we can have activities such as cooking that might be generating air pollutant into the indoor environment. And we also have what I'm calling material-based sources that will kind of continually, continually be reducing pollute, the pollutant into the indoor environment. So materials that are in flooring or couches or something like that that cause a continual emission source. And that will increase the indoor um, concentration. And so as a result, a lot of pollutants have higher levels of indoor environment than outdoors. And we obviously spend much more time indoors than we do outdoors. So some of the Volatile organic compounds that we're interested in, there's a whole suite of these, but some of the ones that, I, that are more worrisome um, are benzene, formaldehyde, and chloroform. Largely, we've kind of fixed the benzene problem for most part. Um, the, we still have sources from motor vehicles, which you don't think of as an indoor source, but if you park a vehicle in an attached garage, or more likely not necessarily your car, but your lawn mower or your snow blower or something like that, that can result in elevated concentrations of benzene in your home. Um, it causes cancer. It also comes from smoking. Then we also have uh, formaldehyde, which comes from motor vehicles, smoking, but also has numerous indoor sources. It's in all those glues that hold together the different wood. So when we have like the fiber, you know, the pressed wood and all those sorts of things, it's in those glues. It causes cancer and then also eye irritation and, and so forth. And then I uh, mention only here chloroform, which is put into, because I know there's water people here, when you have the um, chlorine added to the tap water, particularly from surface, surface water that includes organic materials in it, you can have reactions. Uh, you know, chlorine kills the microbes, but it also reacts with that organic matter to form chloroform. And then when you shower, if you think about it, something like a shower is lots of little tiny droplets of hot water, which you really couldn't ask for a better way to transfer a volatile organic compound from water to air than throwing lots of little droplets of water out for 20 minutes or so. So I wanted to make a, a point on the benzene, even though we're less worried about it. And, and how we think about emissions. Because if you think, this slide is old, but it's such a good one, I really like it, this benzene emissions. If you think about the, all the benzene emissions in the US, 15% come from industry, 85% come from automobiles, and 0.1% come from cigarette smoke. But if you think about the total US exposures to benzene, that drops down on the industry side to only 3% coming from industry because industry emissions are generally so far from us. Direct smoking results in 40% of all of the benzene exposures because people are sucking the smoke into them. That 0.1% from cigarettes works out to be 5% of all the exposure is coming from secondhand smoke exposure to environmental tobacco smoke, which is really getting reduced in California because we have so many regulations. Um, and then we have sort of increased sources related to automobiles and driving and because the automobiles are in the garage and so forth. And if you just look at sort of the automobile versus motor vehicle thing, another way to think about it is if you determine the fraction, not, the, not to the smoker themselves, but to other people living with the smoker in the Los Angeles basin, basically, you know, over one in a thousand of the molecules released from the cigarette is going to be taken up by some member of the population, whereas it's two orders of magnitude lower if you think of molecules coming out of the back of the tailpipe. So anything that's emitted indoors 
that's just sort of magnified in terms of the exposure because of our close proximity. Okay, so I figured it would be fun to have an equation to kind of talk through this. So our <laughs> indoor concentration is going to depend on our outdoor concentration and our sources. For the most part, most of the compounds we're worried about, we have the air exchange rate and the reaction rate of the chemical. The reaction rate is generally low compared to the air exchange rate. So we can almost forget that term, and we just have the outdoor concentration plus this additional term related to the sources. And one of the things you'll notice in the denominator is the air exchange rate. And so it's very important to, to make sure that the air exchange rate is high enough to sort of adequately reduce the concentrations indoors from the sources. Well, here's where we start to get in a bit of a conflict with the energy efficiency because in, in, you know, when we're thinking about energy efficiency, we want to tighten. We often tighten the building shell and reduce the air exchange rate. But we have to be careful that that doesn't get reduced too much because we want to make sure that it's high enough that, you know, that we either reduce the source strength in the home or have enough air exchange to account for um, the source strengths in the home. And here's where I want to talk a little bit about formaldehyde because formaldehyde is kind of where this was first pointed out. You know, as the building shells got tighter through the 80s and the 90s, uh, studies started to be done to find really concerning levels of formaldehyde as it would be related to cancer because formaldehyde is a, a carcinogen. California said, okay, we want to focus on source reduction. And so they actually, um, you, the glues are a big part of the formaldehyde sources indoors. And if you think about where you're going to have sort of the greatest surface area of glues in your in your home is your flooring. If you have like the wood flooring, that's, that's a big area. And so if you have glues under all of that flooring and it's all emitting formaldehyde, that's a pretty big source. So California put the Department of Public Health put in uh, regulations limiting the amount of formaldehyde that could come from wood flooring. Um, and so that did a lot to reduce indoor emissions and lower exposures. Um, I think they're working on furniture and things. You know, apparently you'll see in the news where people break the rules because it is more expensive to make the flooring in a way that doesn't include the formaldehyde. But overall, it's do, really doing good things to reduce our, um, it has done good things to reduce our formaldehyde. And in general, products are having lower amounts. But this is kind of the chemical to, that we're always careful with um, in the indoor environment because there are so many sources. I wanted to touch on a study that we had done looking at small and medium-sized commercial buildings. So this was throughout the state of California, and we had a variety of different building types, retail, restaurant, office, hair salon, so forth. Um, I'm going to skip the animation and talk about the VOC distributions that we found indoors. We compared the VOC, we have the distributions from these buildings for a suite of VOCs, and we have the OEA chronic inhalation levels, and for the most part, they're below. We also have um, the levels of cancer, uh, a 1 times 10 to the minus 4 cancer risk, and a 1 times 10 to the minus, uh, 10, times 10 to the minus 6 cancer risk. And as you can see, the majority of the benzene concentration still, just due to the outdoor levels primarily, is uh, above a one in a million risk, which isn't ideal. But if you flip over to the, uh, the other set of my chemicals, on the formaldehyde, you see that almost the entire uh, uh, set of buildings was above a one in uh, 10,000 cancer risk. Uh, also, acetaldehyde had quite a bit. And so, you know, this is still a compound that we need to worry about. If you look at the building types over here on the formaldehyde, you see that we had some high levels in hair and gyms. This was during the time where they had this um, lovely product called Brazilian Blowout that you put on your hair if, um, to straight, if you have curly, I don't have curly hair, so I don't really know exactly what it does, but if you would have curly hair, they would like put this product on it and then blow dry it out. It had a ton of formaldehyde in it, so that was a little problematic. It was figured that out and pulled the formaldehyde out of that. They thought you'd spray that on people's hair and then having hairdressers work with it was carcinogens was maybe a bad idea. And the other places that were higher were office and retail. And that was primarily because there tend to be also higher levels when there's um, carpeting, because some of the compounds in carpet can react with ozone or inform formaldehyde or emit formaldehyde um, directly. A number of the buildings in my study didn't actually meet 
Title 24 regulations in terms of the air exchange. And so that did, if the buildings had met the, the regulations, that would have brought down the fraction that sort of exceeded the standards. So that's um, VOCs. And now we're shifting gears a little bit to particulate matter, which is our other big heavy hitter in air pollution. So particulate matter is a little, it's fun. Um, and different because it's not a chemical like everything else. It's, it's this particle made up of inert materials, microorganisms, primarily from combustion sources. And so different particles have different sizes and different composition. And so therefore the particles that have different sizes and different composition also lead to different amounts of toxicity. We first sort of realized that particulate matter caused problems Back in 1952, these pictures were actually taken during the daytime in London. Um, yeah, it was really polluted. So, you know, the, the, it, we were, they were cruising along December, and then they basically got an inversion event. So they basically all the air pollution was being held toward the ground, plus it was really cold, plus they burned nothing but coal. And um, so, well, that's just what they used. It was the 50s. And so the, the, basically these smoke indexes that they had went up dramatically for about a six-day period. And this is the number of people that died in London every day. And it shot from around 250 a day up to 1,000 people a day. So basically the hospitals and morgues were being overrun and then dropped back down, but not quite to the same levels, and, and, and eventually hit the 250. And overall, basically, over this air pollution event, an extra 2,000 people died. And so that was kind of like, huh, maybe, maybe this isn't so good. Um, and then over time, a lot of work has been done, and it, particulate matter is the most studied pollutant. The other big way that it's studied, especially to look at the lower levels, is basically um, they'll measure the air pollution level every day in a city, and then they'll take all the hospital records and look at how many people were admitted for cardiovascular events every day and look to see if there's a correlation of higher hospital emissions for cardiovascular deaths um, on days where there was higher levels. And so this is a sampling of various different studies that have been done. Anything where the whole line is above this one means it was statistically significant. Like there was a 95% chance, which is considered statistically significant, that yes, there was an increase in deaths related to increase in particulate matter. Um, so the, you know, when you're really trying to figure out if something's toxic, you want epidemiology to tell you where you study people, and you want toxicology to tell you. You want to have biological mechanisms. And so that they've done studies looking at people's inflammatory response, and that increases with part particulates, which can cause cardiovascular. There's e increased blood plasma viscosity, which can then cause cardiovascular. And there's lower heart rate variability. Your heart is supposed to not be exactly the same interval, but like each beat is a little like shorter or longer, and that makes it so that when you have to have your heart rate accelerate for some reason, it's used to shifting, and so it makes it um, work better. And so they basically, it's like the most studied pollutant and the one that they can prove the best causes problems. So that's why we worry about particulate matter so that when, you know, you've got me going, okay, we need to make sure there's a really good filter in that building that you'll want to put that good filter in there. Uh, the other has health outcomes is it exacerbates asthma. There's been a whole bunch of studies that have shown that. They've done a bunch of studies that show... Um, if the mom was exposed to higher PM when she was pregnant, the babies will have lower birth weight, including one where in China, when they sort of shut all of Beijing down for the Olympics and they had that period with the lower um, air pollution, the babies that went through that in their third trimester were bigger than the babies that had been born the year before. <laughs> and it was statistically significant. Um, and low birth weight is related to a whole bunch of other health outcomes. Uh, some studies have sort of indicated if the, the particles are from motor vehicles or coal burning, they're more toxic. Um, autism rates are higher if there is PM exposure during pregnancy. So a whole suite of outcomes. The other thing that's important that uh, kind of relates to the buildings is there's been a lot of studies looking at distance from freeways for particularly black carbon and ultrafine and things that are related to diesel. So if there's a lot of, um, and you can see, if there's a lot of diesel traffic, and so these particles that are very much smaller, 
they drop off very quickly as you move away from the freeway. And so if you're thinking about a building that's going to be near a highway, the way you filter out particles is going to be even more important for that building because those people are going to be getting the greatest pollution hit compared to a building that might be um, out in the suburbs. Uh, so here, PM's a little bit more complicated because well, when we had the benzene or the formaldehyde trying to get into the house, it was a gas. So it's just traveling along with all of the other gases and making its way through the walls and so forth. But as you guys know, unless you have the windows open, the air is going through some tortuous path to get into the house. And as the air is doing that, those particles have momentum. And so they're, they're cruising along. And if, they're try if the air is making a bend, the particle doesn't necessarily make that bend. It just slams into the interior of your wall or whatever and doesn't make it inside, uh, inside the building. In addition, there's a lot more relevant removal processes once it's in the building. Particles are heavier than air, and so you have gravitational settling that's going to be pulling them out of the air, particularly the bigger particles. And it's, you know, it's fairly still generally inside, and so the deposition can work fairly effectively. Also, if you have a circulating HVAC system, you can have removal as it goes through the filter in the circulating HVAC system. Uh, also, if you're mechanically drawing air from the outside, like this building does, you're most likely running that air through a filter, which is also removing particles. I won't step on the power. <laughs> so, you have, basically, this is how it changes over time. Um, we have factors affecting the outdoor concentration, and then we, we also have sources in the indoor. So even if we tightened everything up and, and, and brought it, uh, made it really hard to get in, that would be great. We could really lower our outdoor contribution, but we also still have this indoor contribution, particularly th from things like cooking, incense burning, candles, smoking, and so we need to make sure that we appropriately account for th those sources. On that Small, medium, commercial building, those aren't buildings that really focus all that much on their building. And you can see um, most of them have fairly inefficient filters, so a MERV-4 filter, which is, removes the least amount of particles, uh, with very um, small fraction of the buildings having like a MERV-12, which if you're, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the MERV filter system, the higher the number, it goes up to 16. That removes basically all the particles as you filter the air through it. And then as the number decreases, you're really, you're getting the biggest particles out, but you're not getting the, the smaller ones out. Um, so it's important to make sure to have good filtration. We also did a study that I wanted to touch on where we looked at adding high efficiency air filters to homes of kids with asthma. So we did both standalone filters and then also uh, filtration through the central system where it was a filter holder that got placed over the old filter holder so that it could allow accommodate a thicker filter that was slightly larger and then uh, we put in thermostats that had a clean air cycle so that it would run for 15 to 20 minutes per hour regardless if the house was calling for heating or cooling um, people were pretty good at running we had uh, uh, computer chips basically in both systems so that we could record the usage that the participants had. We had roughly 160 homes in the study and you can see that the blue here, the blue column means that they were uh, they were filtering their, uh, at least 90% of what we asked them to. We were reimbursing them for this. Um, uh, red is 75 to 90% once they're in green, that's starting to say, even though they had a kid with asthma and they were paying them to run their air filter or run their HVAC system more, they didn't necessarily, um, necessarily do what we wanted to. So we had it, uh, the, the, while we were there for the week and we were sampling, this is the data, and then it's not as good sort of in those th three to six months between when we showed up. But it was okay. So people... People, even if you ask them to do something and pay them, they're not necessarily going to run it. So you can't always rely on that. But we definitely saw a really good reduction in indoor concentrations. So the, we had a way to measure PM.2, which was similar to Ultrafine. We had a good drop there. 
we had PM 0.2 to 2.5 is the drop in red. You see a big drop there as well. PM 2.5 to PM 10, that's kind of bigger particles that were already kind of removed because those are the ones that fall out um, the most from the air, and those are the ones that even if you have an inefficient HVAC filter, they'll remove. So we had less of a drop for those. So those are kind of the, the, the distribution curves. If you, um, the statistical model then said how much reduction we had between the, the sham filter and the true filter. I forgot to mention that we put fake filters in for a while. So basically on the air cleaner, it, um, it sucked in the air from a different section and then blew it out so it just didn't blow through the filter. So it looked like we were filtering their air. Um, that was partly because of this asthma component because we wanted to see how it affected the kid's asthma. But you can see, particularly on the air cleaners, we had really good reductions in PM, um, slightly less reductions on the central home filtration, primarily because they already had an HVAC that was running through some sort of filter. Um, but we had good reductions. And then the other thing that's going to be interesting in terms of buildings and ventilation and energy is uh, window usage because we, we asked, we tried to recruit people that didn't open the windows all that much because if you have your windows open all that time, you're just pulling PM in from outdoors. These homes were all in the Fresno area and the Riverside area where we really had higher levels of particulate matter. Um, and we asked for the week that we were doing the sampling that they record how much they had their windows open. And we did see a statistically significantly greater reduction in their indoor PM concentration if they had their windows closed because the filter could sort of keep up with the amount of particulate matter going into the home. Now, ozone is another compound that we worry about to some extent. The reason we worry about ozone in the indoor isn't because we have levels of ozone. Ozone is very reactive indoors, and so our levels of ozone indoors are basically nothing. But the problem is the ozone will react with other compounds, such as um, like limonene or pinene from cleaning products or aldehydes coming from the carpet and form ultrafine particles. So we're more worried about the ozone reaction products indoors. Um, some other as well-known asthma triggers that you might worry about in an indoor environment are pets, asthma, insects, mites, fungus, all these kind of um, biological triggers. So that's something else that can be important in some cases in the indoor. And then environmental tobacco smoke. And finally, last slide. This isn't, th these are other sources, potential types of compounds that we worry about. They're semi-volatile organic compounds, so they're going to be partly in the air phase, partly in the dust phase. Um, phthalates is one area that we worry about. It's used to make plastic soft and flexible, so think vinyl flooring. A lot of the manufacturers are voluntarily pulling away from phthalates and using alternative plasticizers, um, but that's an important thing. We have flame retardants both in electronics and foam furniture. California has we have lowered these requirements, so we don't have as much, but we still have legacy flame retardants. Um, pesticides and fungicides are used to treat infestations. Pesticides are designed when the light hits them, they break down really quickly. But if you are using them inside, you don't have that light sunlight, and so they last a lot longer. Um, there's some new wallboard, basically, that has fungicides in it for use in bathrooms in humid areas. And now they're realizing, oh, people are, you know, this is coming out of the walls and getting into people. And, oh, some of these might be toxic. So that's not ideal. Um, and then some cleaning products also, particularly in uh, industrial facilities, uh, can cause some irritation. So those are some of the other sort of indoor source chemicals. So I'm happy to take any questions. So, I mean, when you have the increasing wildfire, you've, you're really jacking up the outdoor concentration. And so if you're in a leaky home, you're going to be pulling a lot of that in. If you're in a newer home where it's tighter, the building shell is tighter, you're going to have less of the PM 2.5 coming in. Um, and they haven't, you know, people are still, 
doing the research to see if there were increased adverse health effects related to the exposure to the wildfire smoke. So that's not really done yet. But yeah, I mean, definitely that's something that we need to think about. And especially, you know, California law now requires that a portion of the air be brought in in new construction that you're constantly supplying outdoor air through either a vent or by having an exhaust fan. And we'll want to think about telling people to turn those off in a fire event because you're going to want to just tighten the home up as much as possible when your primary worry is an outdoor source like that. I mean, the whole reason we want indoor, we want ventilation is to deal with the indoor sources, but if we have all outdoor sources, then we want to really shut down ventilation. Yes? Well, there are other sources. I, that's kind of California-wide. I just point out motor vehicles because it is a big one and it is more toxic. In the Central Valley, there is a lot of other agricultural sources. A lot of the agricultural sources also create sort of coarser PM2, so like in the uh, PM10. Um, but yeah, it's varied. And potentially some of that might not be as toxic as some of the combustion-based PM. Yeah. You know, I, think, I primarily think about the micro, microplastics as a big water issue. I don't know if people are looking. I'm not aware of anyone really worried about it indoors. We're more worried about all the plasticizers coming out of the plastic into the air. So kind of, you know, on the plastic side, it's more, and, and that's like whack-a-mole because you're like, okay, we've decided to EHP is bad. That's a bad phthalate. Let's get rid of that. And then you get some other one. You're like, oh, wait, this has got toxic properties too. <laughs> so... We're more worried about the outgassing of the, the things used to make the plastic soft. That's the bigger story in the indoor environment. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just can't swear to the fact that industry is exactly 15% and motor vehicles is 85%. But the point of the big, re I, I show it because it's so informative to see that big reduction of the impact of industrial sources versus the big increase when you go from emissions to exposure of the environmental tobacco smoke, which is released indoors. I just think it's like the, the clearest way to explain like, releasing just a little bit of something indoors has such a bigger impact on our exposure than releasing that same amount outdoors where you're just going to get all that dilution um, with, the, with the outdoor air. Uh, yeah, but I, I, it's actually from a book and I can, if you give me your, your email, I can send that to you, but basically it uh, the, it, was a, it was some modeling. It was mainly a lot of modeling and trying to do the various sources of emissions and, and using environmental models. But yeah, I'd be happy to share. That. Yes? I'm curious about the air cleaner that was used in the mm -hmm. We worked with IQ Air, and they actually did make some special ones for this study just because um, on the air cleaners right now, the big game in town is apparently the noise and the electricity use, and so they had just sort of made some tweaks to their motor to make it a little bit quieter, but it wasn't in their primary one yet, and so they had us use the, the quieter one because we, want, we were putting one of them in the kid's bedroom, and so we wanted to make sure that we weren't causing any problems where the kids would complain about the noise, and so they turned it off. So we did use a custom one. Any other questions? Yeah? You know, we just used the IQ Air in that one. Um, the, the, it was funded by the California Air Resources Board, and so they were very particularly, particular, they wanted something manufactured either in America or in Europe. Um, I'm not sure why. Um, and so the IQ Air fit that bill, and they have a, a strong research arm, and so they really like working with research project, and so it just seemed easiest to work with them than trying to build a relationship um, with a company that hadn't done as many research projects. Yes. Yeah, 
you know, I know that the anti-idling for the school buses, I think, is really um, helpful because one of the things with the school buses is you have all those kids in the bus. And so, actually, there's a really interesting study looking at emissions from different types of um, diesel vehicles and what fraction of those emissions get back to um, people. And if the, the, the particles that come out of school buses expose the most people because those are run in areas where you have lots of kids waiting for the bus, you have kids in the bus, and so those are particularly effective, whereas other ones that are like on a construction site or something aren't going to be as effective because you don't have as many people around there. But it depends on what you're after, if you're focusing on exposure or total emissions to the environment. Anything else? Sure. All right, will you get your second helpings? We have Andy Holguin here from the Center for Water and Energy Efficiency right across the street, and he's going to update us on some of his uh, work. Let's get your mic on, and I'll take your presentation up in You know, she said it wasn't working great, but I think you just go like this and then you clip it in somehow. Okay. Yes? Okay. <laughs> great. Um, all right, so. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Holguin, and I'm an analyst over at the Center for Water Energy Efficiency. And today I'm going to be talking about behavior-based efficiency programs. Um, so I'll talk about a couple of projects that we've worked on recently that, that fall under this classification. And uh, I'll do kind of a general overview of what it is, what kind of approaches you use to evaluate this type of program. And then I'm going to talk about two different projects that we've worked on, one which I'll call the non-optimal design and the other one which is, you know, kind of taking lessons learned and better opportunities to, to do a better, you know, a better version of something related. So my objective is to uh, basically explain to you what a e behavior-based efficiency program is, and then I'm going to do a walkthrough of kind of the types of things you want to be thinking about and the types of data you're going to see and what kind of methods you want to consider if you're going to evaluate one of these programs. Um, so an efficiency uh, program, so first I'll just talk about efficiency program impact evaluation in general. Um, this is just any kind, it can take a lot of different forms, but basically one way or another you want to evaluate the impact of some kind of program, say it's a, uh, a rebate program where they're paying you to change out your appliances to, to something that's more energy or water efficient. And the funding for these is often, you know, coming from an agency or a utility or something like that. So they have an interest in making sure that these these payments that they're making, the money they're spending on these efficiency programs, is actually, you know, causing savings in water and energy use. The challenge is that you can't measure energy or water that, that wasn't used. Um, I mean, you can't. That's not something you can put a meter on. You have to work with estimates. You have to estimate what would have happened had you not done this program. Um, so traditionally. Uh, uh, these are the types of programs where I was talking about where you um, maybe replace an inefficient light bulb or water faucets. There can be a lot of different types. Um, it's not to say that they're traditional, just like that doesn't mean they're boring or anything. There's lots of great technology, interesting market-based methods for implementing these programs. Um, but they focus on a specific technology intervention most of the time. So behavior-based programs, which is what I'm talking about today, focus more on providing information to the end user or the operator 
And that can take a few different forms. So it can have a, they can give you access to like an online dashboard is a popular way of doing it recently. Uh, there's also, you know, WaterSmart or Opower where they, they might give you um, some information on your bill that you see every month and it tells you how you're doing. Uh, maybe it gives you some recommendations for how you could save water or save energy. But the, uh, the main, the, the way that these savings actually happen is by affecting behavior. So it, it might be behavior modifications, um, purchasing behaviors. They, the, you might show them, hey, here's, here's how much water or energy you're using, and they might look at that and think, oh, that's a lot of energy. I'm, you know, it's going to cost me a lot of money. Maybe I can make some changes by replacing you know, some of my appliances to something that's more efficient. Or it might be something more like habitual behavior modification. So the example I have up here is just turning off the water while you're, you're brushing your teeth, for example. Um, but the, the, main, uh, well, the, main, the main idea, though, is that you're targeting end user behavior. You're not paying for like, a specific intervention. So uh, it, just still talking about uh, impact evaluation and approaches in general, there's, there's several different ways of doing this. Um, Dean savings is to say, for example, you know, you replace X amount of light bulbs and we know what the efficiency of the new light bulb is. You can just calculate that you know, more or less directly and just pay for some, some number if that's, if that's a well understood technology. There's also measurement verification approaches, um, which is what we do a lot of. Uh, so we look at project by project, and you track the data. Um, there's several different subcategories in there. So you can do retrofit isolation, where there's something that you can specifically isolate and put a meter on, measure it before and after, see what the impact is. Um, if, it's, if it's impossible to isolate it, you might take a whole facility billing regression analysis approach. Um, so that's you know, if you can't isolate a specific intervention or there are too many to individually meter, you might just look at the, uh, let's say, the electricity use on the entire build, building. And then there's also calibrated simulation. So there are models that you can calibrate to a specific facility, let's say, and then model what impact your, your intervention is going to have. And then lastly, there's large-scale consumption data analysis. Um, and so in this case, you've got a large number of subjects, say households or whatever accounts you're looking at. And uh, you compare the energy use of the, the, the uh, households, let's say, that participated in the program to the ones that didn't participate. Um, so the main point here, though, is that there's lots of different ways to do this. These are really commonly done a lot of times, but they don't really work for a behavioral program. Um, so there's deemed savings won't work because there just aren't reliable estimates for what kind of you know, savings you can expect to happen from your, your behavior modification program. Um, retrofit isolation. There's no. There's no. Ret there's no technology that you can you can isolate. It's just you know you're giving people access to information and they're going to do what they want with it. Um, there, uh, the whole facility building regression analysis. That's kind of your best bet. But the expected savings is usually fairly small, and so you're trying to fit a model to really noisy data. And there's a lot of design problems that, that come into doing that type of analysis. And then just energy. This last one just not isn't really isn't really relevant. So basically, this is what we're left with. This is the, the correct way to do it if you're going to evaluate a behavior-based program. So I'll talk about two, pro two projects that we've worked on. Um, the first one was an uh, agricultural program. And so there was a company that was uh, working with farms in the Salinas Valley and San Joaquin Valley. And they had, a, they had a few different farms that were participating in this, in this pilot project. And they, they gave them kind of, it's, it's basically what I, well, let's see here, it's what I, what I described earlier, which is they give them access to a water energy cost dashboard that tells them something about their usage data. It does some analysis for them. It might make some recommendations. They offered some metering on your, you know, your equipment if you were interested in, hey, exactly what, what's happening with this pump. Um, you could get better data on it. And they did other things like... Uh, Providing peak period alerts. So, uh, if they were on a time of use rate structure and the uh, the grower wanted to avoid paying, you know, elevated energy electricity charges in the middle of the day, they would send the farmer an alert saying, like, hey, you might want to go shut off this pump to to save electricity. I didn't avoid that to the time of use surcharge. So uh, we we are we had a few different roles on this project, but I'm, I'm mostly just focusing on evaluating the uh, the impact of this this project. Um, so I'll, I'll skip through this pretty quickly um, because this isn't really what I want to focus on. But there were a number of challenges we ran into here, uh, mostly just with how this, this, you know, what, what were the data that was available to us in order to do this analysis. Um, a lot of it just wasn't available. There were also, we had some issues with uh, just kind of long-term trends that were occurring across all of the, ag the farms and the, the water irrigation meters in the area. 
Um, so this is just something I want to point out that if, you know, here, here are our project farms that we're evaluating, but just doing a simple before and after comparison isn't going to really give you an accurate estimate because there's, there's just, like, the, this is basically the years of the, the drought right here where there was less, less, you know, water falling from the sky and groundwater levels were probably drawn down. And so basically more electricity was being used to pump water in general across the entire region. So what we did is we, we took, this is, this is the kind of suboptimal design, but it's, you know, it's totally valid. It's the best we could do with the available data is we took a quasi-experimental design approach where we created a uh, control group to, to do our comparison against, but it wasn't done at the outset. It was kind of done after the fact in order to, to get some group that we could make a comparison against. Um, and in the end, we found that, you know, they, there was less electricity and water being used by these farms, but it was, it's really difficult to say that it's statistically different from zero. And what that comes down to is just sample size. There were only four farms participating in this project, and so we wanted to show that, you know, that that's really the limit, is that we, we couldn't really give you a good estimate for what was happening here. Um, so one, one way we did that was just taking data from uh, pump rebate programs. So these are places we, we, like I said, we had data for a bunch of other farms in the area, even though they weren't participating in this project. And some of those farms happen to install, they happen to get a rebate for replacing an inefficient pump or something like that. So we wanted to show basically just like, well, what's happening here is if you, if you were to just do kind of a naive model and just look at what happens after somebody replaces a pump, if you're, if you're only looking at a few farms or a few meters, let's say, you, your estimates are going to be all over the place. If you increase your sample size, though, you're going to start seeing real savings fall out. And so we, first of all, just wanted to kind of validate the method and say, like, yeah, this, this is possible, but what we're dealing with here is a problem with sample size. And so just to, to give the CEC and people some information about, you know, what, what they should plan for in the future, we did a power analysis using the, the data available. And it, it varies. So power, just I should first say, it just means, like, the, the chance that you're going to be able to detect real savings, assuming the program causes savings. So just detect a real effect with statistical significance. And in general, depending on the size of the savings you're expecting, we, we should have really had access to, you know, somewhere between 100 and 400 or so farms to actually estimate what the savings are coming out of a program like this. Um, so lessons learned from this project, you know, it's particularly difficult in ag. Um, there is, you can do a random, you, there's different methods that are available to do this type of study. We took the quasi-experimental approach in this project just because we didn't have the ability to go back in time and redesign it as a uh, randomized control trial. But that's really the best way to do it. And so because many of the people I work with are engineers and stuff, a lot of the literature for doing randomized control trials and evaluating these large projects comes from economics and social sciences. So what I'm doing next is just kind of running through what this type of project would look like, the types of things you'd want to consider. Um, if you were going to do this type, if you were going to design a program like this. Can I um, ask why you only had four farms? Is it cost or like that, is it expensive to have the app or something? No, that was just how it was designed from the outset. So I should say this, this company was a startup. When the project began, they didn't even really have a, a product. The, the, the funding was kind of mostly to just spur innovation and encourage development of, you know, solutions in agriculture. So, I mean, I don't know that... The, 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 the savings that people were expecting were never particularly huge. Um, and then they also, I think, just weren't really sure exactly what was going to happen. <laughs> so they were hoping that, um, you know, that these farms maybe would, would see that, hey, they could save money by replacing this pump. But um, I, I mentioned this um, some other time. Is that, uh, at the Affiliates Forum last week or something, the, one of the speakers you know, said, you know, asked the question, why do people replace inefficient equipment? And his main point was that, well, they replace it because something breaks. It's not because they necessarily think they're going to save money. That's the main reason. So in the end, during the course of the, that project, not much actual physical equipment was really replaced. So we ended up kind of having to fall back on just estimating, well, what are the behavioral you know, impact that, that comes out of this? Um, yeah, I mean, ideally, we would have had more farms, or they would have you know, made more technology changes. But the way the project you know, played out, that just didn't happen. So anyway, there's a new there's a new project though, and it's not like a follow up from this or anything, but it's it's a it's a project with East Bay Mud and PG&E, and so East Bay Mud is the water water utility PG&E, you know, gas and electric. I guess I don't have to explain that to this audience. <laughs> uh, they're they're installing a bunch of AMI meters, uh, like many water utilities are, 
and they're giving the customers who get these meters access to an uh, enhanced dashboard that's going to have information about, you know, more, more detailed information about that customer's water and energy use. And they're going to be providing, you know, recommendations, trying to identify leaks, basically give more information to these customers in the hope that they can save water and consequently energy and gas. Um, so this is going to be a whole series of slides just on experimental design. I'll talk about what kind of data we're looking at. Uh, for this presentation, I just kind of simulated some data because I want to use it to illustrate, you know, a few points. So what we're, what we're talking about here is panel data, and so that's what you typically call it, and, you know, when you're working with this type of stuff. And so you have measurements from individual subjects. So these are water meters, let's say, and I, I have one year, one year here that, I've, that I'm showing. And when you want to think about how you're going to estimate the savings, you have a really noisy data set here, um, but the, the framework that people typically use is this potential outcomes framework. And so we do our intervention, and now we've started our efficiency program, and we expect to see, see some amount of savings. This one up here is the hypothetical, what would have happened, you know, had we not done this intervention. Uh, well, and like I said before, we can't actually measure that. This is, this is just what, you know, because I'm simulating this data, I can show you that. But in general, we don't know what that, what that line actually looks like. Um, so because I'm simulating this data, I can show you that, you know, there's a three, call it CCF or whatever, it doesn't really matter. Some, some amount of savings that comes as a result of this program, three CCF per month. Um, so what you might decide you can do is just do simple before and after. Say, well, what, what do they use between the baseline period? What do they use afterwards? I uh, just superimpose those two lines here, and you're going to estimate the difference. Well, you do your estimate, you see, oh, hey, great, they saved 1.8 CCF, let's say, per month. And you report your savings, and you think you did everything really great. But because I'm simulating this data, that's not right. I can just tell you, well, no, actually, they saved three CCF per month. Um, so what happened here? Well, when I simulated this data, there was an underlying trend in what was happening, you know, just in the general population. So think about that example before where I showed how water and energy use vary as a result of drought conditions. And if we didn't know that was happening, we would have, in this case, underestimated the savings of the program. So I'll, you know, kind of get to the point here. Basically what I'm saying is the way to do this is with a <laughs> randomized control, growl, control trial. In the baseline period, you um, randomly assign households to either your treatment or control group. Because it's random, all of the control group households would be, expect, would be affected by the same, you know, background, random outcomes, whatever trends are happening to the population in general. And that will allow you to actually estimate the, the real savings. So that's what we're doing with the SpayMud pg e project. Um, there's a couple other things you would want to think about if you're working with this type of data. Uh, so one, let's talk about let's talk about precision next. Um, let's see if I can refresh this real quick. So, say you have one household and you're collecting data on it, and you get you know ten. I think I did ten or fifteen data points here. Each time you get a new data point, your estimates become more precise. My question is, does that what does that tell you about the average household in the district? Let's say. We have 10 data points, but that's not really telling us what the average is in the entire district. It's telling us what the average is for this household. So let's, let's do this. Let's go to the next one, and we'll, we'll compare this to it. Um, refresh it real quick. Alternatively, say you take a number of households and you measure the, um, the water usage from each one of those households. That's more directly estimating what the average is throughout the entire district. So my point is there's two different types of data points here. Taking repeated measurements from the same household, it gives you more information. It makes you more confident about what the average use is for that household, which tells you something about what the average is for the entire district. But there's, it's, it's, you don't have as much information as you, you don't have, you know, like 10 different independent data points here. So the first point I want to make is just make sure you're using cluster robust standard errors, um, which accounts for the fact that not all your data is independent. Um, and then I mentioned before that the expected savings from these types of programs is generally fairly low. You also have lots of other challenges with actually getting good statistical power. So. Um, Uptake rate, for example, is fairly low. Say you design the best program in the world, and as soon as somebody sees it, they just think, oh my god, I have to replace all my appliances with you know, more efficient ones or something like that. The problem is that most people just aren't going to bother to look at it. 
So we have to kind of design with that problem in mind and um, estimate, first of all, well, this, this slide is talking about just effect size. If we're expecting to see a, a larger impact from our intervention, then we can get away with a smaller sample size. If we're expecting to see a smaller impact from our, our program, we have to increase the sample size. If we're not expecting a lot of people to actually look at this, we have to increase the sample size. There's uh, several different factors that go into it. Um, but that's, that's one of the concerns that, that we have if you're designing this type of program. Um, so there's lots of other concerns. Um, treatment uptake rate. Uh, we're, we're trying to improve our power again by basically uh, strat there's there different ways you can actually do the random assignment to treatment and control. Um, you can just completely randomize it and say, you know, 50 go to this the treatment group and 50 go to the control group. Or you can kind of uh, more on the other end of the spectrum, you can stratify your households to make sure that whether they get assigned to treatment and control is uh, evenly balanced by pre-existing, you know, um, say like their, their baseline water use. And because you're minimizing the variation between your treatment and control groups, you end up with better power in the end. Um, there's lots of other just kind of things you can consider, uh, different types of enrollment options, whether or not you're opting people, you're allowing people to opt in or you're, whether you're allowing people to opt out of your program, um, whether you tell them, you know, that they, they have to, you know, participate in your program or you just kind of give them some kind of encouragement to decide to do it themselves. Um, one concern is uh, double counting. So for example, say there's a rebate program going on for washing machines and the customer decides to, you know, they, they have access to your, your behavioral program as well and so they, they decide to install a washing machine. Well, who gets credit for that? Is it the rebate program or is it your behavioral intervention which pushed them over the edge and made them decide to, to, make, to make that purchase? So, um, you have to decide how, you know, basically are you double counting savings for different programs. Uh, and then lastly, I'll just say just generalizing the results is still something that, you know, isn't, that the reason why we can't just kind of use a deemed savings approach and say like, well, this program, you know, we know is going to get, you know, 3% savings or 5% savings is just because it's, it's not known yet how well these, these programs generalize. So basically extrapolating it to new populations does the, uh, does the savings persist over time or is there a decay where people bounce back and just revert back to their original behavior? <coughs> um, and then expansion here is just kind of the combination of both of them. So I think that's my last slide. Um, thanks, any, any questions? So this, this East, East Bay Mud PG&E, they've installed all the meters at this point. They're still working through, they have these like collector towers which, you know, receive the, the transmissions from the, the AMI meters and then, you know, directs it all to their central database. And so they're still doing some debugging of, you know, making sure they can actually receive data for, for all these meters. But the meters are installed at this point. Um, we're working on finalizing the randomization. So we're, we want to do that to maximize our power. Um, so we're, we're any day now should be getting actual AMI data coming in, and we're going to use that to help design our our, our you know randomized uh, assignment strategy. And then oh the sample size I didn't mention that yet they're installing 10,000 meters is what we have access to. And like I say that sounds like a lot, but the thing is most most people probably aren't going to bother to log on to their web portal. You know that's just kind of the, the way it goes. So. So, uh, you know, that's why we, we have such a big sample size. I think their plan and the, the actual program start date when they're going to start sending out messages to people is still a month or two away. So it's still, still in progress, but it should, it should become live fairly soon. Yeah, well, so I'll, I'll say, I mean, this, this is not necessarily my area of expertise, you know, <laughs> but we've we found ourselves kind of more and more of these behavior-based programs are, you know, being rolled out. And so we're, we're finding that, yeah, I mean, we need to understand how to, how to evaluate these objectively and get, you know, unbiased estimates. Um, 
and we've definitely looked at, you know, what, like I, that slide where I mentioned all the different approaches that, you know, have happened historically. There's deemed savings, there's all kinds of like, you know, retrofit isolation, whole building regression. Uh, these are all approaches that people have done, um, but they, they just, they don't really work for behavior, you know, behavior-based stuff. Uh, they work best for technology interventions. Um, so we, yeah, we, there, and there's also, there's a lot of literature about doing this type of programs in, um, in like economics, so like the World Bank and IMF and, you know, different, different organizations design these types of programs where there's an intervention and they just, you know, they, they have to, you know, estimate how people respond to them. So I think the, the approaches, yeah, the approaches that, that people have used for evaluating conservation programs in the past, you know, we can definitely learn a lot from them. Um, but the way that you go about evaluating these types of behavior-based programs, I think, just is, is a little bit They've different. Been evaluating behavior-based programs like the Okay. There's a, there's a group called the Institute for Behavior. Yeah. Every two years. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to say like no one's ever done this before. I mean, people have definitely been thinking about this for a while. Um, what I'm describing here is basically just what I've what I've learned. I just kind of wanted to share with the group about how you would go about doing this. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely other people who have thought about this before. And what I'm showing you here comes actually mostly from a uh, manual um, published by the uh, what is it? It's like the uh, State Energy. Action Network or Energy Efficiency Action Network or something like that. They have a whole manual based off of behavior-based evaluation programs, and the uh, EPA have have their um, their their I forget what they call them, but basically they have a they have a whole uh, I think it's the EPA. There's basically there's several organizations. There's all kinds of different manuals for how to do efficiency program evaluation. I think it's the DOE actually has their Uniform Methods Project. That's what I was trying to think of, and they they recently a few years ago adopted a whole you know procedure for doing behavior-based efficiency evaluation, and it's basically what I described here. Yeah, so I mean, so there, there's a couple of things I'll, I'll say about that. So like, yeah, there, what, what I'm mostly describing here is, is estimating the, the average treatment effect. So it's kind of taking into account the fact that, you know, a lot of people aren't going to do anything. Um, you can also estimate, you know, the, the, the treatment effect on the people who actually uptook treatment, who actually looked at the portal, who actually responded. And so that's a different estimate, and you would use slightly, you know, you use different estimators to, to look at that question. Um, but then also just talking about kind of whether or not it's practical. I mean, it, I guess it partially comes down to cost effectiveness. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think in the end though, when we're estimating the, the average impact of the program, it, it should, I mean, it's, it's telling you what, what is the, the average considering the fact that many people probably didn't do anything. So that, that's gonna tell you, you know, whether that, that'll give you the number you need to to decide whether or not this program is cost effective and actually worth doing. Yeah, we're going to um, we're going to get access to that information. Like I say, the program isn't live yet, so we're still kind of you know negotiating what exactly we're going to have and finding out what exactly uh, we're going to have access to. But we're definitely going to know whether or not they've accessed the portal. Uh, we should yeah, ideally keep track of how many times they log in. Like, do they, do they check it every month or do they just kind of log in once and forget about it? Um, a lot of this comes down to more kind of yeah nuanced estimates uh, versus just what I mentioned a minute ago, which is estimating the average treatment effect. So the first number you want to know is just the average treatment effect, regardless of what people did, just what kind of, what's the average number, what's the average impact of your program. From there, you can start looking at more local effects, like, well, for the people who actually logged in regularly, what kind of impact does that have? Um, so those are questions we're interested in, uh, but yeah, they just kind of become the more, the more nuanced questions that 
have plenty of opportunity to, to decide what those are at this point. Cross collaboration, because I mean, it wasn't like planned this way, but like public health deals with this stuff all the time, right? With like, you know, you do certain things to try to make sure that you have things that have an impact. Um, you don't want any kind of cross collaboration in kind of utility space with like public health and um, other groups that look at similar issues but different topics. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know about any of those specifically so like this this program is kind of exciting I think just because we're getting the water utility and the energy utility to collaborate is kind of a big thing for us to begin with uh, just reconciling all of their data and getting everybody on board and um, committed to this project has been you know I think a huge challenge in itself uh, so sure there's probably additional opportunities to to look at wider, you know, wider collaborations as well. But I guess at this point, yeah, just just getting water and energy utilities on the same on the same program and on the same page has been, I think, an achievement. You have a couple of people who are currently working on a project. <laughs> 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 a true public health person, but we do have a couple of people. Okay. 